Dana White may not have ever laced up gloves and fought inside the octagon, but over the years it has become clear that the UFC president has one incredibly tough job. Whether he's dealing with the massive egos or trying to deal with the numerous controversies that engulf the UFC every year, Dana has managed to find his name in the headlines more often than 99% of the fighters on his payroll. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at 10 times Dana White managed to shock the world. Let's get into it. Number 10. Buying the Promotion The year was 2000 and though the UFC was by no means on death's door, the 1990s really hadn't seen it make anything close to a den on the mainstream market. Seen by many as far too violent for mass consumption, few could ever have imagined how far the sport of MMA would come when Dana White and the Fertitta brothers Frank and Lorenzo decided to invest. $2 million was the sum of money it took for the newly formed Zuffa to take the reins over what was seen by many as a real long shot, as far as business moves go. But as soon as Dana and co got their hands on the UFC, to say that they turned it into a major success story would be putting it lightly. Over the next two decades, White would be at the helm of everything the UFC did correctly, eventually building it up to a point where it would be sold to WME IMG for a whopping $4.2 billion. We're sure that more than a few were left puzzled by the decision to buy the UFC, but after years of constant growth and success, it's pretty safe to say that Dana White's early instincts were proven to be incredibly sharp, that's for sure. Number 9. Never Back Down the idea of Dana White fighting the light heavyweight champion at any point in UFC history is pretty crazy, but when the promotion's president decided to commit to boxing Tito Ortiz a few years back, the MMA world were left totally shocked. Not only did it take some real balls for Dana to step up to the plate and actually agree to fight a world champion athlete in front of the world, but what was truly hilarious here is that Tito was the one who didn't seem to be all that willing to accept the fight. According to Dana, Ortiz knew exactly what would happen if the two ever fought. Their beef actually started when Dana was his coach and manager, and in Dana's own words, it was an MMA matchup. Obviously, the Octagon legend would have a field day, but in the squared circle, there would only be one winner, and it wouldn't be the Huntington Beach bad boy. Unfortunately, this fight never happened. Tito picked up an injury that saw him withdraw, but to this day, Dana will take any opportunity he can to take a shot at his one-time pupil. More often than not, the resulting comments are nothing short of hilarious. I got in decent shape around season three, because as many of you know, I was going to do uh, three rounds of sparring with Tito Ortiz as part of his contract. He put in his contract that he wanted to fight me to get rid of all the, the bad blood that we have between us, and I accepted. I started to get in pretty decent shape for uh, around season three because I thought that's when it was going to happen. And Tito actually sent me a text, hold on, let me grab it. I saved this. <laughs> so he could never say he didn't say it. Tito Ortiz, I asked him, are we gonna spar now, are we gonna do this thing? No, my knee is too sore, I have to wait till after my fight, so I'm pussing out, little bitch. Number eight, do you wanna be a fighter? When Dana gets fired up about what it means to be a fighter, sometimes he's doing it just so he can take shots at athletes who turn down fights, furthering his own agenda. But during the legendary first season of the Ultimate Fighter, Dana was forced to really try to hammer home exactly how much of an opportunity these fighters had in front of them. There was some real confusion with the tough cast when it emerged that some of them weren't aware of the fact that they would have to fight on the show, meaning that they would be fighting without any payment. When Dana heard about this unrest, as you might expect, he was far from happy. What followed was a true star-making moment for the UFC boss as he called a meeting with the cast. He then proceeded to ask them directly if they had a problem with being asked to fight, before then explaining exactly what was expected of them if they wished to pursue the life of a fighter. This attitude would be the one that Dana would go on to carry all the way through to the modern era, but the first time he took his athletes to task was really something to behold. Do you want to be a fighter? That's, That's the question. That's why I'm here. It's not about cutting weight. It's not about living in a fucking house. It's about do you want to be a fighter? It's not all fucking signing autographs and banging broads when you get out of here. It's not. It's no fucking fun, man. It's a job, just like any other job. So the question is not did you think you had to make weight? Did you think you had to do this? Do you want to be a fucking fighter? That is my question. Number seven, relieved of his duties. This next one is quick and simple. The event was UFC 267 and the matchup between the debuting Benoit Saint-Denis and Elizio Zaleski dos Santos left us all with a real bitter taste in our mouths after the French prospect Saint-Denis was forced to take on some potentially career-altering damage in a thoroughly one-sided beating. In general, the consensus was that the referee in question had done an appalling job at protecting the fighter. Dana White, who had never had any problems with making an example of these officials, immediately withdrew the referee from the card, ending his night and his UFC opportunity before the even really began. Number 6. The Abu Dhabi Incident 
It's not unlike Dana White to bash one of his champions. Over the years, he's had more than a few belt holders that have made an enemy of him, just ask Tyron Woodley. But when the long since established Anderson Silva left a major UFC event in Abu Dhabi in tatters with a truly odd showing against Damian Maya, White was so furious that he refused to place the belt around the Brazilian's waist. Dana, to this day, will refer to this as perhaps the single worst day in his time as UFC president, and the general vibe he gave off in the post fight press conferences as he repeatedly criticized his greatest middleweight champion was truly shocking to behold. Sure, no one is above criticism, but Dana is also kind of supposed to be a promoter, right? I gave what did you say? I left in the fourth round and I gave the bed belt to Ed and I said, you put it on him. I'm not doing it. <clears throat> do you have any interest in seeing him defend the title again, or do you think he just needs to be challenged? Because as we said in the press conference, when he fights at 205, he's knocking guys out in the first round. Yeah, I agree. I, I, seriously, I don't know how to fix this. Um, my head hurts like right here, right now. <laughs> And I, I honestly, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know why he acted the way that he did. He comes in and the other thing that uh, is even more baffling is that he feels that he doesn't owe the fans an apology. Yet I'm apologizing. I didn't go in and fight like a jackass for five rounds. I didn't do the, what he did tonight. But I'm, I'm embarrassed and um, I feel like I should apologize to the fans and I feel like I owe the fans one. And, like I said earlier, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to pay everybody back. Remember, if you're enjoying our content and want to see more, be sure to leave a like before subscribing to the channel so you don't miss out on any of our weekly uploads. Number five, this is not a career. It's hard to know whether Dana ever regrets saying the things he said, but for our money, there was no quote he's ever gave that summed up just how messed up his treatment of fighters had been than this absolute gem. During an ongoing discussion about fighter pay and the unwillingness of some of his athletes to compete during the COVID-19 pandemic, Dana let all of us know exactly what he thought, telling his fighters that a spot in the UFC is an opportunity, not a career. As you might expect, this went down terribly with the media, the fans, and the fighters, making an all-time dud in Dana White's long history as a president. You know, when you're a professional athlete, you have a very small window of opportunity, a very limited amount of time. You know, we, we get into all this money sh and the stuff that's going on right now. Everybody acts like this is a fucking career. This isn't a career. This is not a, a career. This is an opportunity. Anything can happen in any given moment. Knee can blow out. You're back. You're this. You're that. Um, COVID-19, you know, I, who the hell knows what's, what, what is coming down the pipeline. This video is brought to you in part by Manscaped.com, the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products. Manscaped offers the best tools and liquid formulations for the big three odor zones, your body, butt, and balls. Manscaped hooked me up with a ton of stuff from their all-in-one performance package 4.0. Let's check it out. First thing is the Lawnmower 4.0 Body Trimmer. This is Manscaped's fourth generation electric waterproof trimmer with advanced skin safe technology, which reduces nicks and cuts on the most sensitive regions of the body. It also has a super smart cordless charging system and these little LED lights on the front to show you how much juice you have left. Tap the three buttons on the front three times and it enables the travel lock feature. The kit also includes two products I never knew I needed until now, the Crop Reserver Ball Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray. This is their Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Manscaped really has you covered from head to toe. For a limited time, you can get all this plus two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. Go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts when you use promo code WATCHMMA at checkout. Manscaped always uses the right tools for the job. Number 4. The Money Fight if there's one thing that we all thought Dana White would never do, it's allowing one of his biggest stars to set a major precedent by dipping into boxing. And in hindsight, it should have been easy for Dana to see how many problems he would cause for himself down the line by letting Conor McGregor box Floyd Mayweather in one of the biggest fighting events of all time. And yet, he still did it. He still co-promoted with Mayweather Promotions in Conor McGregor's own promotional banner. This brief green light into crossover events changed things forever, and now everyone seems to be vying for their own dip into the squared circle. This, of course, brought about new conversations about fighter pay and fighter freedom, which, as we all know, Dana White works extremely hard to avoid. You, you interviewed Floyd, right? I have. You had to aim the camera down here, right? <laughs> Floyd's about this tall, okay? His hands are like peanut brittle. He has to wrap them a million times so he doesn't break his hands. Floyd better hope he don't run into Connor on the street. Let me tell you what, Connor, not only will Connor kick his ass, He'll kick the shit out of every one of his uh, security guards too. So, oh, 100%. Really? 100%. But I, I would love to be there when Floyd tries to slap Conor McGregor. Well, that's what he said. He said on oh, his. I, yeah. I promise you, 
I promise you, Floyd, you will never try to walk up and slap Conor McGregor, and you know it too. Well, number three, signing Ben Askren. Jump back to maybe 2015, 2016, and the very notion of Dana White and Ben Askren even sitting down for a cordial chat would be totally unrealistic. Prior to his retirement from the sport and his disastrous UFC run two years afterwards, Askren was seen as perhaps the single greatest fighter outside of the UFC. The problem? Well, he and Dana didn't always see eye to eye, and this in the end deprived us of the chance to see the funky one in his athletic prime. So when Dana and Askren finally made amends and decided to work together after the UFC traded the flyweight goat Demetrius Johnson, Johnson to one championship, we were left totally stunned. Not only did the idea of seeing Askren in the UFC totally seem impossible just a few years prior, but watching as Dana traded away one of the greatest fighters to have ever laced up gloves is truly one of the strangest deals the UFC has ever made. I don't know what I do to make people think I hate them. I, I, I don't hate these guys at all. I don't talk... Lene, uh, did I not talk to Ben Askren in the back hall when we were walking out for the thing? It's crazy. Number two, High Roller. Details about Dana White's personal life aren't as widespread as you might think. Sure, we know what he wants us to know, but given his larger-than-life personality and endless supply of money, it's only natural to suspect that the Dana White who operates behind closed doors, it's different from his on-screen persona. On an episode of his podcast, longtime color commentator for the UFC Joe Rogan explained just how wild things can get in Dana's life when he revealed that White was a big gambler on the Las Vegas scene, losing as much as a million dollars in one night while winning over seven million. Dana was so good at blackjack that he had been banned from betting in several high-profile casinos in his own hometown of Las Vegas. Not one to be outdone, White would always then pull the UFC out of hosting events and venues in question. Call it petty, but either way, Dana's reputation as a notorious presence in Nevada has not gone unnoticed. Here's what's interesting though, if you win, they ban you. Like my friend <laughs> right. Dana, like, how is that if legal? you lose, they can be right White, home. Dana White is a notorious gambler, but he wins millions of dollars sometimes. He's wow. won, I think he said he lost as much as $1 million and he's won as much as $7 million in a night. Wow. Holy sh he gotten banned from places? Yes. He couldn't, really? Yes. Dana, yes. Think he's a celebrity. Dude, That's so not weird. only does he get banned, but he gets banned and then he pulls the UFC out of them. Like they used to do UFC at the Palms and he killed the Palms and the Palms banned him. So he's like, fuck you. I'll ban you. We're gonna move to the Hard Rock or wherever the hell they moved to next. If you've ever wondered about Dana White's track record, as far as the past legal issues are concerned, you might be surprised to hear that the UFC Prez has been arrested on more than a few occasions. When asked about any skeletons he might have in his closet, Dana responded by saying that he had in fact been arrested a few times ranging from assault charges due to fighting in his youth to underage drinking. Normal stuff as he puts it. Of course, White was never seen inside the jail cell, but it is pretty interesting to hear him speak candidly about the few brushes with the law that he has had. Number 1. He did what? Okay, we fully know well that superstars are going to get their special treatment, but the UFC 232 debacle involving Jon Jones was on another level of privilege entirely. Just days out from what should have been a Las Vegas event headlined by the return of John Jones, the always controversial star managed to test positive for trace amounts of the very same substance that saw him stripped of the title that he won beating Daniel Cormier at UFC 214. According to USADA, this was because of a pulsing effect, one that was not caused by an ingestion of the same banned substance. The Nevada State Athletic Commission did not accept this, however, they refused to allow Jones to compete. So Dana being Dana decided the best option would be to move the entire event to Inglewood, California. California on just a couple of days worth of notice. As you might expect, the response from the general public was a total shock, and as much as Dana tried to justify his actions, the UFC let a lot of people down on this day, even if they managed to save their headlining bout in the process. Yeah, listen, it's not an easy decision to make. You have to, you know, you gotta pull the trigger and <clears throat> you gotta make moves. You're not gonna make everybody happy. You can't make every fan, every fighter. But we gave the fans in Las Vegas the opportunity to get tickets first, and the tickets are cheaper. We had over 3,000 people, you know, buy tickets here that had tickets in Vegas. We did everything we could to, to make it better. We did what we could do. And that'll just about do it for this video. But what's your own personal favorite Dana White moment over the years? Let us know in the comment section below. Again, if you enjoyed today's video and want to see more, be sure to leave a like before subscribing to the channel so you can stay up to date on all of our latest uploads. Thanks for watching.